Welcome to this third video in the video series on chemical reactions. Now you might find it strange that I am starting this video off with the photograph of a very big white mountain. But there's a reason for this as I'm going to sketch a context about the content that we're going to cover in this particular video which is linked to the climbing of mountains. Now Mont Blanc means white mountain and it's the highest peak in Western Europe. It's just under five kilometers above sea level. It's approximately five table mountains high and I have a personal story about this which is going to help you to understand what we are going to cover in this particular video. My story starts on Table Mountain where I met a crazy wild mountain man by the name of Paul who invited me to climb this very high mountain in Europe. And so in 2014 Paul and I we decided to climb this very big mountain and here is a photograph of me on my way up to the top of this mountain. Now I can assure you that this required a huge amount of energy that I needed to put in in order to get to the top of the mountain. As you can see from this photograph on my way up I am pretty tired because I have had to expend, I've had to use a lot of energy in order to move against gravity to move higher and higher and higher up this mountain. Eventually Paul and I got to the top of the mountain and it was an absolutely amazing feeling to be on the top of Western Europe. Now I have to tell you that albeit that there's a lot of sunlight there it was freezing and it actually wasn't very comfortable to be there for very long. So we decided after we had taken a few photographs and my wild friend Paul had done 10 push-ups, crazy man, that we were on our way down because it simply wasn't comfortable to be at the top of Mont Blanc. So down we went and yes it took some energy to get down but in actual fact we were losing energy because we were losing gravitational potential energy as we were getting closer and closer to the bottom of the mountain so the amount of energy that we had due to gravity was getting less. And yes it was dangerous, it's sometimes more dangerous to come down a mountain as you can see here then to go up a mountain. Eventually when we got to the first camp which is what's known as the Gauta camp we had actually arrived at the destination on the first day down. And keep this in mind because we're going to talk about final destinations a little later on in this video when it comes to chemical reactions. So in the second video we mentioned energy hill diagrams in the context of a chemical reaction where we have initial substances which we call reactants or reagents and what I've done here is I've represented the molecules of these two different reactants by a pair of blue individuals with long blue hair I would suggest I would think that they would be pretty scary if you actually met someone with such long blue hair so that's the one type of molecule and then the other reactant is made up of a molecule which I've represented by two red individuals and notice that they're holding hands so this holding hands represents the bonds the chemical bonds inside each molecule which keeps the atoms the people together. Now up we go as they climb up the energy mountain or the energy hill they land up breaking apart and so they land up like Paul and I did on the top of Mont Blanc right at the top of this energy hill and they are broken apart they are each individuals they are separate individuals they no longer holding hands so it's like the individual atoms that we're making up the molecules are now separate atoms. Now it's uncomfortable up here it's like Paul and I on the top of Mont Blanc it was a wonderful view we had taken a huge amount of time and energy to get to the top 
and we got to the top here and we looked to the left and to the right and all around us and it was wonderful but it was uncomfortable. The same is true when atoms are on their own. They don't like to be on their own, much the same as we don't like to be on our own. So then what happens, they go down the energy hill, like Paul and I went down Mont Blanc, and they said, let's go down, and let's pair up, and note, the pairs are now different. So the molecules are now different. Yeah, this molecule was made up of two blue long-haired individuals, and this molecule of two red-haired, no, should I say bald red men, and yeah, each molecule is made up of one bald red-headed man, or should I say no, no hair, red man, and a blue individual. So each of these molecules is identical, but these molecules now have a different structure to these molecules. So the reactants have gone up the hill. In so doing, they've broken apart. They come down the hill and they rejoin, but now they are no longer the same molecules, no longer the same pairs. And so this is a very simple representation of what happens when substances react from the initial situation to the final situation where products are produced. So now looking at this concept in a more formal way, the energy yield diagrams are, as I've mentioned, more formally known as energy profile diagrams, much the same as you see on TV with CSI, if they're tracking a, a serial murderer, they will have a psychologist that sets up a profile it's a set of characteristics which they can then identify how the person thinks and how the person behaves. Well, yeah, we look at the profile, the shape of the behavior of the substances according to their energies as they move from being reactants through the unstable activated complex all the way down to the final result, which is the products. Now, please do not get intimidated by this. I would like to firstly state that this particular section is more about you understanding than writing tests and exams on it. You may get questions in your tests and exams which are simplified, not with necessarily with all these complicated or what seem to be complicated labels, but albeit that it initially looks complicated, it really is about chemicals climbing an energy mountain like Mr. Duffield and Paul, getting to the top, enjoying the view, and then moving down to eventually getting to where they are now products. So let's first look at how we formally set up the energy profile diagrams. So an energy profile diagram is in actual fact a graph. And so it has a y-axis and it has an x-axis. Along the x-axis is time. And along the y-axis or the vertical axis is potential potential energy. Now you've done a bit of energy in grade 7 and we really don't expect you to have a deep understanding of what potential energy is in grade 8. That is more for grade 11 and grade 12. But I can assure you by the end of the year you will understand what potential energy is way better than what you do at the moment. Now in the context of chemical bonds we can think of the sugar that we love to eat. Now we know that we eat sugar to get energy. Now I know we, we like sugar because it tastes sweet, but the real reason why we eat sugar is because inside the chemical bonds of the molecules of sugar, the glucose molecules, is a hidden energy that sits between 
the nuclei of the atoms in the molecules. Now you'll learn more about chemical bonding in grade 10, but for the time being, I want you just to know that inside each molecule is the ability, is the potential for energy to be released when that particular chemical bond is broken. Now, what an energy profile diagram does is on the vertical axis, it records what the energy is, the potential energy, we could actually say the chemical potential energy because it's actually the energy in the chemical bonds, what the energy is of the molecules of the reactants. Now in this case we can say this reaction is where reactants A plus B become AB. And so the reactants it could be hydrogen and oxygen, it could be carbon and oxygen, it doesn't really matter. This is a general approach to reactions. These reactants, and there wouldn't be just one or two molecules, there would be billions and trillions and quadzillions of these molecules, but the sum total of all the chemical energy would be that value there, the energy of the reactants. Now, like Mr. Duffield and Paul, when we were at the bottom of the mountain, we started there and we needed to move up. Now, this energy is an increase in energy. And remember that photograph of me climbing up the mountain? Energy needed to go in to getting to the top of the mountain. Now the question is, where does this energy come from for the molecules to be able to get to the activated complex? The answer is in them colliding with each other. So if they collide hard enough, then the energy of the collision will be enough for these particles to break apart and so they form the activated complex. Now this highest point is like the top of Mont Blanc. It's the highest point but it's not comfortable. It's unstable. So the particles, the separated atoms don't stay there for very long and so they fall back down and eventually they recombine to form the new substances, the products. So in doing that, they give energy out. So it's much easier for them to fall down than for all these molecules to climb up. And it's the same as with a mountain. It's easier to come from the top of the mountain down than to get to the top of the mountain from where you start at the bottom of the mountain. Now, this is a little bit like climbing a mountain where you start high up on the one side and you land up way lower on the other side. And uh, the, the idea of the mountain is just to give you an idea of the fact that to go from reactants to products doesn't happen easily. It requires the molecules to hit each other hard enough in order to get over this energy yield. So the energy in is the energy required to break the bonds of the reactant molecules. The energy out is the energy formed, is the energy given out to the environment to form new bonds of the product molecules. Now scientists love to make people think that they are smarter than everyone else. So they love to use symbols. And so the E, the big E in science and in physics and in chemistry is very often used for energy. And the subscript, in other words, the word that's dropped below the main symbol in is telling us that that's energy going into the system and by system we mean the molecules all the molecules in the reactants now this symbol yeah e out means this is energy going out E products is the energy of the products once the reaction has taken place. Sometimes we, you will see that I will shorten this. I will abbreviate it to E product and this to E reactants because these are the energy, energy of the reactants. So the, this is the energy of all the reactants. Now, this 
can very easily confuse learners on grade 8 level. Now, the triangle stands for the Greek letter delta. It's like D, but in the Greek alphabet. And D for difference. D for change. So you can see here, you should be able to see that once the reactants collide and they react with each other, the energy is continually changing. So this triangle here represents the change. And you're going to see this all the time. You're going to see it in mathematics with gradient and slope, change in y over change in x. You're going to see it with velocity, changing displacement over changing time. This is a symbol that is very, very important in science and mathematics. What it actually means is it's the change in the heat. Heat is energy. So what is the effective or the net or the resultant change of this reaction when it comes to energy? Well, the energy of the reactant started there. And when the reaction was complete, the energy of the products ended there. So it, the, from an energy point of view, the reaction started there and ended there. So this delta means the difference between there and there. It's called the heat of reaction. Now, in the previous video, you learned about exothermic and endothermic. Now, reactions that give off a net energy from out of the system of molecules to the environment are known as exothermic. Think of when you go to a movie house and you exit the movie house. You are going from inside to outside. So exothermic reactions are where the energy goes the net energy is from inside the molecules to outside to the environment. E net can be calculated by using this formula. The energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants. Now I know this might be a lot for you to sort of try and digest at this point in time but you know what? Practice makes perfect. So let's practice these concepts. So in our first example, we are given the following energy profile diagram or the energy hill diagram where we have these values 30, 90 and 150 on the vertical axis. Now the vertical axis is the potential energy of the molecules, of the chemical bonds in the molecules. We use a unit, kilojoule, it's much the same as Kilometer, kilo means a thousand. Joule is the unit for energy. So we are working with energy, so kilojoules. So it's 30 kilojoules, 90 kilojoules, and 150 kilojoules. In grade 8, we are going to have a time axis, but we are not going to physically use units of time. And the reason for that is because the unit of time can vary dramatically. So if you're dealing with an explosion that happens like bang and it's sudden, the time between there and there could be a few millionths of a second. But if you're dealing with something like rusting, which is a chemical reaction where something that is a metal like an iron nail rusts over several weeks, then the difference in time between there and there would be several weeks. So we're not going to work with time in grade 8. You do work with time in grade 11 when we have a whole section on what they call the rate of reactions or the speed of reactions. So we asked to determine EA. The A stands for activation energy. Remember I said to you scientists love to look clever. So capital E for energy and A is for activation or the energy in. It's the energy from where the reactants start to where they get to the top of the energy hill. We also asked for the energy of the activated complex, the energy out when this reaction takes the substances from the top to the bottom. We'll look at that in more detail. The change in heat energy, the heat of reaction, the net energy. We asked to look for that or to determine that. And then the question, is this an exothermic or endothermic reaction? Now, this is a hypothetical reaction. What do I mean by hypothetical? I mean, it's not 
to physical substances. We're not using a specific example like hydrogen H2 plus O2 produces 2H2O. We're looking at a general reaction which consists of a molecule that has a type of molecule which can be symbolized by X2. Each of the atoms is capital X and because they're bonded together they form a diatomic mole molecule and then Y2 is represented by two Y atoms in the molecule, also diatomic. Molecules don't have to be diatomic. They can sometimes have millions of atoms in them, but we're keeping it simple. These are the reactants. We're going to see that as the reaction progresses with time, an activated complex is going to be formed, and then finally the products. So let's look at how we go about solving this particular problem. So in solving the problem, the first thing I would suggest you do is to identify where the reactants are and where the products are. So the reactants are here. Remember Mr. Duffield and Paul starting at the bottom of the mountain. They are the reactants. Think of the energy levels in us when we started off. That would be ER. I have abbreviated energy of reactants. To be ER, sometimes we use E react, R E A C T. That's where the substances start with energy 90 kilojoules. Then they move with time, they move along this path, they have this profile. This the path has a shape, and this is an energy path. Eh? So they move from 90 kilojoules up to the top which is the activated complex. That's where it's the equivalent to Mr. Duffield and Paul being on the top of Mont Blanc. The highest point, at this highest point, the atoms that make up the reactants are now broken apart. They are separated and they have a total of 150 kilojoules. So that is in actual fact the energy of the activated complex. We'll come back to that a little later on. So what is the energy of the products? Well, yes, the products, so that would be the energy of the products. E out, as we're going to see, is the energy difference between the activated complex dropping all the way down to the energy of the products, which is 30 kilojoules. So starting with the activation energy, Ea, Ea, a for activate. Now activate means to get something started. So the activation energy is the energy required to get the reaction going. And so that energy we can see. And this is what I want you to do. I don't want you to learn formulae in a recipe-ish way. I want you to understand the physics. And I want you to understand the chemistry. Let's look at what's happening. There are the reactants. And we see here that the reactants are here and they're moving to the top, the energy in. So it's from 90 joules to 150. What's 90? 90 plus what gives you 150? Well, that's 60. So the activation energy is the energy of the activated complex minus the energy of the reactants. So 150 minus 90 gives us 60 kilojoules. The next question is, what is the energy of the activated complex? Well, that's always the highest energy of the substances, of the particles in the system. And that's always going to be at the top, 150 kilojoules in this particular example. But it's always going to be the most unstable part of the energy path of these particles. So the energy of the AC, AC for activated complex is 150 kilojoules. Now I know that in science language is exceptionally important. What does activated mean? It means energized. It means it's got lots of energy. So this is the part of the path, the journey from reactants to products where the atoms are the most activated, the most energized, but it's also the most unstable. So therefore, that means that it's, the system is not going to stay in that particular state for very long. 
And so the particle's energy will then drop, like Mr. Duffield and Paul moving down the mountain. And so when they move down, when the particles move down, and I mean energy-wise, energy is given out. And so we say, okay, how do we work out the energy given out? Well, we always work with the final minus the initial. So along this path, the final, the energy of the products is 30 joules. Sorry, it should actually be kilojoules here. This is actually incorrect. And so I'm going to just quickly correct it with KJ. And so we can see that the final is 30 kilojoules and it started at 150. So along this path where energy is given out with the new bonds forming, it's 30 minus 150, which gives us minus 120 kilojoules. Why minus? Because the particles are going from a highly unstable, highly energized state to a low, lower energy stable state. So energy is being lost by the particles. But guess what? The energy doesn't just disappear. It goes into the environment. So when you see that you see the minus sign, you know that energy is being lost by the system, by the particles. So the energy lost is minus 120 kilojoules. So what is the net energy? Well, the net energy is the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants. The substances started there at 90 kilojoules and ended at 30 kilojoules, more stable because of a lower energy. So E net is always the energy of the products, the final energy of the system, minus E react, which is the initial energy of the system. And so we've got 30 minus 90 gives us minus 60 kilojoules. Guess what? The minus means energy is lost by the system. So then we can answer whether this is exothermic or endothermic. Now, I've actually already given you the answer. The fact that the net energy is negative, the fact that the heat of reaction, remember E net and delta H are the same thing. It's like saying something, we've got six eggs or we've got half a dozen eggs. It means exactly the same thing. When your heat of reaction is negative, it implies that energy is lost to the environment by the molecule. So in other words, energy is exiting the system exiting the molecules and therefore this is then an exothermic reaction. Now when you measure the temperature of the substance you're actually measuring the energy in the environment. In other words the energy outside of the molecules because the energy inside the molecules is potential energy. The energy outside of the molecules is motional energy. It's kinetic energy. So temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy. We'll learn more about this later on in this, this course in grade 8. But so what I want you to remember is that temperature does not measure the energy inside the molecules. It measures the temperature outside of the molecules. So if energy is leaving the inside of the molecules and going outside of the molecules, guess what? The temperature is going to increase. Now what does this arrow mean? Okay, Well this arrow here means if you've got an exothermic reaction this leads to and this is a increase. So I use some symbols unfortunately as a, a science teacher uh, I've got my own language sometimes I call it confusoglyphics a bit like hieroglyphics except it's specifically designed to confuse science students. So up means increase, down would mean decrease, and this symbol means implies, or if this is true, then this is true. It's the implication symbol, use it in mathematics too. This means, this implies exothermic reaction, and this means leads to, or results in, an increase in the temperature measured. Now I remember when I was a student, many, 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 many years ago, and I encountered these energy profile diagrams, these energy yield diagrams. 
I was completely confused. You see, I hadn't climbed mountains at that stage. And I think many of you haven't climbed mountains either. But what you all do every single day at school is you climb up and down stairs. So let's relate what we've learned to climbing up and down stairs. So let's start off with our reactants. Yeah, at the bottom of this part of the staircase. So every time they go up, their energy increases, their potential energy increases. So let's represent molecule X2, that type of molecule with two red guys holding hands, and molecule Y2, that type of molecule, to ladies holding hands. Although nowadays guys also wear hair like that, so these similar type people wearing their hair like that, let's say they're twins, and they shout out, we are the reactants. And now they move one step, two steps, three steps, four steps, five steps up. So they've increased the number of steps by five steps. So that's like increasing the energy. Now they get to the top here. And you can see they have broken apart. They all separated. But hey, there's not enough space there for them. So they say, hey, social distancing, please. So they can't stay here for very long, especially at Parklands College, Mrs. Stane would come along and say, please move away, move away, move away. So they move down. Now when they go down, they are decreasing their height. So we say this is a minus one step, minus, minus one step, minus two steps, minus three steps, all the way down to the bottom. So they, it's like energy being given out. And when they get to the bottom, they are no longer X2 and Y2, but now X and Y, X and Y. So it's as if new bonds have been formed, new partnerships, new molecules. So what is the effective change in steps or amount of steps that they took? Well, they went up five steps, they went down 11. So plus five minus 11 gives them minus six steps. So if they were to have gone down six steps, all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, ah, they get to the same height. That's like the heat of reaction. It's like the effective amount of steps actually carried out. Now, we know that they didn't go down just six steps to go from there to there. But the effect is if they just went down six steps. But we know that the path that they followed was five steps up, got to a uneasy, highly unstable situation, and quickly moved down to form a new situation. So in chemical terms, we could say X2 plus Y2 was changed into this arrow. Remember the horizontal arrow means leads to or becomes two XY molecules. And so this would be an exothermic reaction because the products land up being at a lower energy than the reactants. Therefore, we have reactants less stable than products, products more stable than reactants. So this represents an exothermic reaction. Practice makes perfect. So let's try another example. So yeah, you are given another energy profile diagram. It looks slightly different. It's got different values, but you're asked to calculate the same quantities, the activation energy, or the energy in, the energy of the activated complex, the energy given out, the heat of reaction, the net energy, the same thing. And then you ask, is it exothermic or endothermic? And as you can see, we are using similar symbols for reactants and activated complex and products. But remember, this is grade eight, so we're keeping it simple. But the same theory can be used for exceptionally complex and exceptionally large and long molecules that have to react with each other. But for grade eight, keeping it simple, working with simple diatomic molecules as reactants and diatomic molecules as products will suffice. So pause the video and give this a try. And then we are going to look at the solutions very quickly in order for you to check whether you got it right. And remember in science, it's cool to be wrong, because if you're wrong, 
it means that at least you gave it a try. And there have, there's no one on the face of this earth, not even Nobel laureates, that got everything right in physics the first time. So pause and give it a try. So first thing we do is we label the, the products and the reactants. So we always start off with the reactants. So those are the reactants. So the energy of the reactants is 100 kilojoules. And then we have this point here, the highest point, the activated complex. The energy of the activated complex is 300 kilojoules. Always look to the symbol in the label of the axis. And then finally, the products are here. So the energy of the products is 220 kilojoules. So the energy activated, the energy required in order for the reactants to break apart into activated complex is going to be from 100 to 300. So energy in is energy of the highest point, the activated complex, minus the energy of the reactants where you start. So from reactants to activated complex, from 100 to 300 means plus 200 kilojoules of energy is taken in by the molecules. You can see the 100 plus 200 gives us 300. To get the 200, we say 300 minus 100. The next question is, what is the energy of the activated complex? That's easy. You always go to the summit, like Mr. Duffield and Paul. You go right to the top. There where it's uncomfortable and unstable, and then you look at the energy. 300 kilojoules. There we go. As simple as that. Then we look at the energy out. Energy out is how much energy is given out by the molecules from the activated complex to the products. Ah, I actually said something wrong. What did I say wrong? Well, yeah, they're actually not molecules. Yeah, the reactant molecules have broken apart into individual atoms. So from those individual unstable atoms to the final products, that's the energy out. We always work with final minus initial. The final energy of this part of the path or journey is the energy of the products. The initial energy along this path was the energy of the activated complex. So energy of products minus energy of activated complex is 220 kilojoules minus 300 kilojoules gives us minus 80 kilojoules. To go from 300 to 220, it's like going downstairs. It's minus 80 joules. Minus meaning that energy is lost by the molecules. And then we are asked, what is the heat of reaction? Now, the heat of reaction is the net heat. Eh? It's like looking at how many effective steps would you need to take to go from where you started to where you ended. Eh? So we started here, yeah, the system started here yeah, with 100 joules and ended, it went this way, but it ended with 220. So 220 minus 100 gives us plus 120 kilojoules. Let's, let's just do this again. E net is always E product minus E reactant, final minus initial. E product, 220 kilojoules. There we go. Energy of the products, 220 minus the energy of the reactants, the initial energy of the system, minus 100 kilojoules, minus because it's the difference. 220 minus 100 gives us plus 120, plus because energy is taken into the molecules. Oh, this is different from the previous example where energy was lost by the molecules. We see here that the net energy is positive. It means that the molecules have increased in energy. But where does that energy come from? Well, it has to come from the environment. So if delta H, or the energy net, is positive, it implies, remember the symbol implies, energy taken into molecules from the environment. This implies it's an endothermic reaction. Okay, endo in biology means inside. We think of the endocrine system. I think it's the hormonal system. I'm not a biologist. But endo is inside something. So yeah, energy is being taken inside the molecules. And if that's the case, then the energy of the environment surrounding the molecules drops. 
Therefore, there is a decrease in the temperature measured. So, endo leads to a decrease in the temperature measured. So, we've done two examples. And if you don't fully get it yet, it's okay. It's okay, because remember, practice makes perfect. I can tell you that I didn't get these right the first time I tried them, neither the second or the third time, maybe the tenth time. Practice makes perfect. So to end off, let's just summarize the concept of endothermic reactions by using the analogy or the illustration of walking up and down stairs. So in an endothermic reaction, our reactants, X2 plus Y2, or yeah, in this case, they walk up 10 steps, plus 10 steps, plus implies up. The X2 and the Y2, they break apart into Y, X, X, and Y. We don't lose people along the way. We don't lose atoms along the way. There's a conservation of atoms. There's a conservation of people in this example. And so, yeah, at the top, we are family but we can't stand together too closely because of social distancing. So we need to move. And by the way, when I say we are family, I mean Parkland's family. Eh? I'm not talking about your family at home. So Parkland's family, you still can't stand within one and a half meters. So this is unstable. They move down. But in this case, they move down five steps to the next level. So this is like going from the ground level to the second story and then back down to the first story. And we can see that on the way up, these pairs, these molecules, as it were, broke up. And when they came down, they reformed into different pairs. Instead of X and X and Y and Y, it's X, Y, X, Y. So there's two X, Ys. These are the products. And the reactants were X2 plus Y2. So we can write the reaction down in symbols. X2 plus Y2 leads to 2XY. This is what we started with, the reactants. We are the reactants. And this is what we ended with, two XYs. We are now the products. And so what is the net effect of walking up and down? Well, if we look here, we went plus 10 up, minus 5 down. Well, that's the equivalent of moving plus 10, minus 5, of moving plus 5 up from there. Well, let's take a look. If we move plus 5 up, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we get to the same level as where the products are. So this would be like an endothermic reaction where the products land up having a higher energy than the reactants. Now, there is so much physics and chemistry behind chemical reactions and people study doctorate degrees in this. So just very, very quickly, I want to end off by saying that in exothermic reactions, your products land up being more stable than your reactants. They have a lower energy. And what drives that is, actually, in actual fact, the principle of nature to try and produce a more stable environment. So think of someone who does skating, skateboarding, the half pipe. If you stand on your skateboard at the top of the half pipe, and you let yourself roll down backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Eventually, you're going to get to a point where you're going to land up being on your skateboard if you haven't fallen off in a stationary position right at the bottom of the half pipe. That's the lowest energy state. So there's a natural tendency to move to the lowest energy state. That's like exothermic reactions. But endothermic reactions are driven by something different, not by trying to get the minimum most stable energy, but by something called entropy. And entropy is a quite a complex concept, way beyond school level, which is a measure of the state of chaos or disorder in a system. And so if you left your room on your own and your mom and dad didn't attend to your room, your room would get more and more and more chaotic, especially with the clothing and the shoes all over the place. It's the same with endothermic reactions. Endothermic reactions land up having a higher energy, but also a higher entropy. And so they are not driven by minimizing energy but by maximizing entropy you are never going to be asked that but one of the things i wish my science teachers taught me was about what lay ahead and what i didn't know so science is an amazing endeavor 
We have the whole universe to our disposal to learn about. And so there's always something we don't know. So don't be intimidated by that which you don't know. Be excited by it.